Hello everyone and welcome to the CISN webinar, Media Training How to Prep Execs for the Big Interview. I'm Michelle Tisdell, Director of Product Marketing, and I'll be your moderator for today. During today's webinar with Brad Phillips, we're going to learn how to transform your media coverage with one simple technique, showcase your brand's best traits with effective media responses, and portray your organization positively when answering challenging questions and avoid repetition but keep messaging consistent. Before I introduce Brad, we have a few quick housekeeping points. Questions. There will be a moderated Q&A at the end of the webinar, so feel free to use the chat box on your webinar panel to submit those anytime throughout the webinar today. If you're on Twitter today and you want to tweet about this webinar, please use the following hashtag CisionWebinar, all one word. And if you want a copy of the slides, they'll be posted to Cision.com and SlideShare after today's webinar. The top uh, hashtag, uh, the, or the top tweeter today is going to receive a Cision prize pack in the mail, and we'll be revealing those winners on Twitter shortly after the webinar today. And now I'll introduce our speaker. Brad Phillips is the founder and managing editor of the Mr. Media Training blog, the world's most visited media training website, and president of Phillips Media Relations, a media and presentation training firm. He has trained thousands of media spokespersons and public speakers, including corporate CEOs, presidents of nonprofit organizations and trade organizations, and directors of government agency. Brad is the author of Media Training Bible 101, Things You Absolutely Positively Need to Know Before Your Next Interview, and is on Amazon's number one public relations bestseller. And with that, I will turn the presentation over to Brad, and welcome. Thank you very much, Michelle, and good afternoon, everybody. I will begin with this man, the man that you hopefully are seeing on your screen right now, a gentleman named Bob Diamond, who, as you can see, was the former CEO of Barclays Bank, a big international bank. I'm starting with him because he was faced with a brutal question during a media interview shortly after the market meltdown in 2008. The reporter was dogged. He, he would not let Diamond go with an easy answer. And the question he wanted Diamond to answer was this. You make $30 million a year. That's 1,000 times as much as your bank tellers. Are you really worth 1,000 times as much as your bank tellers? Well, Diamond tried to answer that. And the first couple of attempts weren't terrible, but the reporter kept persisting and persisting. And finally, he just withered under the follow-up questioning. And you can see on camera as Diamond shrugs and gets a bit of a churlish smile and lets out a nervous laugh. It looked really bad on camera, and the reporter got the moment that he wanted. In my experience, that question to executives, why do you make so much money, may be the single toughest question that any executive uh, ever has to face. And... Imagine, though, if Diamond had prepared more adequately for that question, and it was not a question that couldn't have been predicted. He could have said something more along the lines of this. Are you really worth more than 1,000 of your tellers? Well, on a personal level, no. Anyone who comes into our bank knows just how good our tellers are at their jobs. But my role as CEO is to grow the bank, and if I do my job well, there will be more job opportunities, more tellers, and more room for upward growth for our entire staff. And with that responsibility, yes, comes increased compensation. Now, that response may not be poetry, but it would have been a whole lot better than the shrug that he gave and the nervous laugh that he offered. And I start with that story because it makes an important point about media training, which is that with solid preparation, executives can face even the toughest questions with confidence while retaining their credibility, and, and hopefully not just retaining their credibility, but uh, to enhance their credibility along the way. Michelle already gave me an introduction, so I am going to keep this part very short. I'm the president of Phillips Media Relations and the author of the Mr. Media Training blog. And I'm also the author of two books, The Media Training Bible, uh, which Michelle mentioned, and also the new book, 101 Ways to Open a Speech. And in today's webinar, we'll be talking about these three main topics. For those of you who may not be able to, uh, for, for those of you unable to see the agenda, number one, 
how to develop media messages for your executive, number two, three tips for better media answers, and number three, how to answer challenging questions. So we'll begin with part one, which is how to develop media messages for your executives. And in a moment, I'll share with you a tool that we use with our trainees to help them deliver more effective media messages. But first, I want to share with you the biggest problem that I typically see. And that is that ambitious PR and communication staff members too often draft these massive documents to give to their executives before an interview. And those Q&A documents are often full of details, talking points, examples, support and proof points. And I've seen these documents that can in some cases be 15, 20 pages. More often than not, I find that that quantity of detail is more paralyzing to the executive than it is helpful. And I saw this uh, in one specific case when I worked with a very smart hotel executive. She was very dutiful about studying the talking points that her PR staff had prepared for. But as we turned on the camera to do practice interviews, it became immediately clear to me that uh, she was freezing. And when we finished the interview, I asked her what, what was happening. Why was she frozen? What, what had gone wrong? And she said, I have to remember too much. And it was clear. You could see all over her face that that was true. When I work with somebody like that, that has clearly been armed with too much information, I often ask them, okay, so out of everything on these 10 or 15 pages that have been prepared for you, what are the three things that you want to communicate the most? And oftentimes, that executive has to think for a few minutes before answering that question. And that right there is a sign to me that the materials they've been provided haven't worked. Because if I ask that question, what are the three things you want to communicate, in good prep materials, they should be able to find those two or three main points and tell me immediately. So if they have to think that hard, something went wrong in the prep. I would maintain that your job as a PR professional is to simplify the prep for them. And I'm going to be blunt, maybe a little bit provocative here for a moment, but I maintain that giving your executives too much information is a sign not of helpfulness, but that you're afraid of making a decision. Or maybe to be a little bit more charitable, it's that you're unauthorized to make a decision and that you don't have the final say in what those messages are. But nonetheless, it leaves the executive in the same place. So I don't want to suggest that giving your executives background material is a bad thing because obviously you want them to understand the issues that they're talking about. But I am suggesting that on a separate document, the one they take into the interview, uh, that that has been distilled to the most important points in the fewest words you possibly can distill them. Uh, so in the case of that e hotel executive I mentioned, once she reduced her 10-page document down to three phrases, we turned the camera back on and she was great. We gave her less and she was more effective. That's not an uncommon experience. With that as the backdrop, I'd like to introduce to you the system that we use with our clients for both developing and remembering their media messages during an interview. The first thing I would say before showing this to you is that I would suggest that every answer your executive gives during an interview should be on message. Now, when you hear that, you may immediately recognize that there are problems with that statement. The first one is you probably don't want your executive to come across sounding inauthentic. Uh, what, what nobody wants is for their executive to sound like the politicians uh, on Meet the Press. Obviously, this election cycle, you have some politicians who are a little bit more direct than others. Perhaps that breaks the mold of the overly scripted uh, politician, but I think you all know who I'm talking about or what type of politician I'm talking about when uh, I say that many of them are overly scripted. So you don't want your executive sounding like that, and you also don't want them to be repetitive. Uh, so this is a system intended to help uh, alleviate both of those problems, and uh, it's something that we call the message development stool or the message support stool. As you can see on the top, it's your message supported by three legs, stories, statistics, and sound bites. And for most interviews, we suggest that you come up with three main messages, and beneath each of those three messages, you develop some support points, those story stats and sound bites. Now, stories, you probably all know what they are. They're anecdotes, case studies, uh, pieces of customer or client feedback. Statistics are a little bit less obvious. Most people, when I say statistics, think about numbers. And numbers are not what I mean by statistics because in most cases, statistics are not particularly sticky. People, unless the number is so spectacular for some reason, tend not to remember them. 
So what I usually suggest is that people begin with a statistic, but then try to put it in some kind of relative frame or relative value that gives it more meaning. And on your screen right now, you see a screenshot from a commercial that was part of an H&R Block ad campaign a couple of years ago. Some of you may have seen this during the tax season. If you haven't seen this, I wrote down the specific script that uh, this spokesperson was saying during the commercial. This is what he said. Last year, thinking they could do their own taxes, Americans left behind more than a billion dollars. That's $500 on every single seat, not just in this stadium, but in every professional football stadium in America. This is your money. Get it back with Block. Get your billion back, America. So first of all, if uh, the PR person from H&R Block is on this webinar call, uh, you're welcome. That was uh, free publicity. But it was a great ad, and it was deserving of, of great publicity. What they did was not rely on the statistic. The statistic was Americans leave a billion dollars on the table every year. But they didn't leave it at that because a billion is an abstraction for most people. Instead, he said $500 on every seat on every professional stadium in the United States. That's memorable. And so what I'd suggest you do when you are preparing for an interview and you come back to this message support stool is first write down the raw number or the raw data point and then try to put it in some kind of context that gives it more meaning. The final leg of this stool is for sound bites. And sound bites I'm not going to go into great depth on in this call. It is those short, very memorable phrases or sentences. They are often rhetorical questions or analogies, metaphors, similes, something with very powerful or emotional language embedded within it. If you're interested in more on sound bites, you can visit our blog, Mr. Media Training. And in the search column, just write in the, the, the term sound bites. I think it, two words is better than one for search purposes, sound bites. You'll come up with all of our posts on sound bites. So how does this all work in practice? How does this all work actually during a real media interview? Well, this is what ultimately all of that pans out to be. You see on your screen now three message worksheets. Let's say you've written down your three messages at the top of each of those worksheets, and beneath those three messages, you've put in those stats, stories, and sound bites. If you have three messages, and beneath each of the three messages, you have two stories and two stats and two sound bites, that's 21 different things. And the reason that's important is because having that many things written down means that you don't have to repeat yourself twice during an interview. So in practice, the way that this works, the reporter might ask you a question, and your answer number one might be, well, let me give you my message. Hopefully you don't say those words, but you get your message out in your first response. Question number two, you might say, well, let me put that in context, and you give one of your data points. Question number three, you might say, you know, we recently saw something very similar to that. One of our clients had this experience in which, and now you're telling a story. So you see how you can be bouncing from a message to a story to a statistic and also a soundbite, but every answer that you give is unique. So you're not being redundant. You're not saying the same thing twice. You have 21 different options just in doing this worksheet of how you answer questions. So in extended format interviews where you might be asked 20 questions, you still don't have to repeat yourself twice. But regardless of which answer the reporter uses in the, in the end story, it in some way reflects one of your main messages or themes. So this is the method of message development that we recommend uh, that your spokespeople go through, that your executives go through. And the final point I'll make here is, in many cases, we've seen our clients, our executives, go into a uh, conference room with their message worksheets and just check off as they go for phone interviews. They'll check off their answers as they give them, and it's not uncommon at the end of an interview for somebody to leave and say, all right, well, I gave 14 of those 21 answers. Not bad. Uh, obviously, there may be some unanticipated questions that you didn't prepare for, but in many cases, especially more straightforward interviews, we find that people usually, or oftentimes at least, can predict with some precision almost all of the questions that they'll be asked. That's part one, how to prepare executives for an interview in terms of messaging. With that, we'll move on to part two, which is three tips for better media answers. The first tip that I'll offer you here is to remember the why plus what. And to explain what that means, it's important to keep in mind that we are conditioned from almost the moment that we're 
not born, but the moment that we begin learning how to speak to give a what response to a what question. So if somebody, for example, says, what's the weather here in New York where I'm talking to you from, uh, the weather's about 85 degrees and sunny. That's a what response to a what question. We're conditioned to do that. And in most cases, a what response to a what question works very well in most forms of communication, but it doesn't really always work best for media interviews. To give you an example, and this is very common, this happens in almost every media training session that we do, maybe it's happened in your internal media training sessions, if you lead off a practice interview by asking an executive uh, what appears on the surface to be a very simple question, like, can you tell me about your company, I would say 98 or 99% of the time I get an answer that I call a structural answer, something along the lines of this. Well, we're an association based in Washington, D.C. that represents more than 50,000 small business owners in the United States who are trying to expand trade into foreign markets. That is a what response to a what question. And it's not a terrible answer because it does convey real information, but I would say that it does very little to break through the clutter of the thousands of messages that we're all exposed to each day. And I'd also say that it's understandable why executives give answers like that. Executives are really tasked with overseeing an entire company or organization or association, and they are the people responsible for seeing an organization from the 35,000-foot level. So when you ask them a what question, um, they tend to speak in, a, in abstraction. What they lose in that is anything concrete, and concrete answers are what non-expert audiences understand best. So to help address that, what we recommend is beginning an answer like to the question, what do you do, what does your company do, with the why, the context first. And so just to give you a sense of how differently that sounds, let me ask the same question, and I'll give you the why plus what version of that answer. So what does your organization do? If you're a small business owner and manufacture a product, you might want to export your product into foreign markets, but few entrepreneurs have the expertise to be able to do that alone. Our organization represents more than 50,000 of those business owners and helps them get their products, everything from shoes to handmade toys to gourmet foods, into markets that they wouldn't be able to reach on their own. That version is, well, it's certainly more concrete. It gives more concrete information. But if you consider the fact that people are exposed to thousands of media messages per day, I would argue that that type of response does a whole lot more to break through the clutter than an answer that you typically would find at the bottom of a press release, that kind of more boilerplate, uh, 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 the boilerplate line or two that's usually at the bottom of a press release, the footer. Uh, it, it, it's much more catchy than that. So the first tip I would offer for better media answers is remember the why plus what. The second tip is to keep your answers short. Now, every executive is different. You may be blessed with executives who tend to keep their answers pretty short, but it is not uncommon in our experience to also encounter a lot of uh, executives who enjoy talking and who occasionally enter into a filibuster. Uh, and it, in terms of the perfect length, if there is such a thing, I generally recommend that people try to keep their answers to the 30, maybe 45 second mark. Any more than that, and I find that the executive or spokesperson is usually beginning to wander off their message. And wandering off message is problematic for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons it's a problem is that executives often will read the story when it comes out, and they'll say, why did the reporter use that quote out of everything that I said? It was intended just as a throwaway line or as background. If you say it, they can quote it. So that's one reason to make sure you're not... Uh, giving answers that are unnecessarily long. The other reason that we find that this often happens is executives often want to educate the reporter, and that is a noble impulse. But it is often one that is counterproductive because the reporter leaves even more confused than when they walked in the interview. Or put a different way, here's the way I kind of conceptualize this. In a good interview, reporters may have scribbled 12 pages of notes. Oftentimes when reporters come to your office, you'll see that they come with a steno pad, and they will be scribbling notes as the executive is talking. When that reporter leaves the interview, one of two things is going to happen. The reporter is either going to flip through the steno pad and very easily be able to say, ah, okay, that, that was a key point, and this is a key point, and that's a key point. Or the reporter is going to leave and say, I have no idea what the main point is. Let me just select one of these things that the executive said, and maybe I'll use that in my story. So you can control that to some degree. The shorter, the tighter the answers are, the more you 
make sure that one of your points is highlighted in some way, the better the odds that the reporter will make sure that they star or underline that in that way. So when they walk away from the interview with those 12 pages of notes, those notes are prioritized in some way. And although it's never a guarantee that just because they put a star next to the quote you wanted them to use that they'll actually use it, it sure increases the chances that they will. Short answers help you do that. Long answers do not. So one easy technique you could use, if you are one of the people who has executives that tend to talk on the long side, one very easy tip that we use uh, that almost always guarantees a better response is after, let them go. First of all, let them go with their long response. At the end of it, I usually say, that was great. Now, can I ask you to do that one more time in 20 seconds? And at that point, I'll take out my phone and I will take out the stopwatch and I'll say, okay, 20 seconds, go. Re-ask the question, start the timer. When they are restricted to 20 seconds, almost always the answer is better because all of the secondary and tertiary information is gone. They had to get rid of that. So in many ways, you are forcing them to get back to the most important parts of their answer, which usually results in something stronger. Now, one warning. Even though I've been advocating for shorter answers, too short is also a problem. Uh, somebody who gives a very terse answer is often viewed by the public as evasive. And so here I always think about legal depositions. The advice for anybody that's listening and that has ever been deposed, you know that the advice attorneys often give you is um, answer the question with as few words as possible. And so the kind of stereotypical joke that lawyers will sometimes use is the answer to the question, do you know what time it is, is not 9.30. The answer to the question, do you know what time it is, is yes. So that's what they will do in a deposition, but do not bring that quality to media interviews. In a deposition, the formula might be answer the question and stop. In a media interview, the formula is answer the question, advance a message or one of those message supports, and then, but only then, stop. So there's that one extra point that's particularly important there. So that's point two, keep your answers short, but not too short. And finally, speak to your target person. Now, I know that everybody listening has, if I were to ask you to identify your audience, you probably could very easily brainstorm half a dozen audiences that are important uh, to you. And I don't mean to minimize any of those audiences because in many ways they're all important. But the problem from a media interview standpoint is if you go in with such a loose definition of who you're trying to reach in that interview, I find that too often people end up reaching almost no one. And one of the questions, it's this really great exercise in media training workshops we do, you could do this in your internal training prep, is uh, to ask the person that's being interviewed, okay, who are you talking to? Who's your target audience? And usually the person will say, I don't know, general public, or I'm speaking to our customers. That's still vague. So now I do a free association exercise with them. And I say, okay, I'm going to ask you a series of questions. There's no right or wrong answers. This may be uncomfortable because you're thinking of the political politically correct answer to give, but I want you to try to get rid of all of that thought and just give me the answer that pops in your mind immediately. Okay, who are you talking to here? Is it a man or a woman? Uh, let's say the person says it's a woman. Okay, how old is that woman? She's between 40 and 50. No, 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 I want a number. How old is she? 45. Okay, she's a 45-year-old woman. Is she married or single? She's married. Okay, does she work? Yes. What does she do? Well, she's a manager at a clothing boutique. Great. Does her spouse work? Yes. What does he do? So we get into real detail in figuring out who this person is. And often by this point, I'll say, can you visualize in your mind what this person looks like, how they're dressed? And almost always they can tell me how the person is dressed. And then I'll say, give this person a name. And they'll say, I don't know, the person's name is Susan. Great, you're talking to Susan in this interview. The reason this is such a powerful tool, even though it's reductionist, the reason this works really well for media training purposes is because then we turn the camera on and we do a practice interview. And when we play back the answers that the executive gave, I might stop the, the, video, the videotape after one answer and I'll say, that answer you just gave. Did that reach Susan? And oftentimes the executive will say, ah, not really. Say, so, okay, let's do it again, and this time make sure you're talking to Susan, and that executive is able almost instantly to fix the problem because he has a specific person in mind. So identifying that target person is a very quick fix when people are speaking at the wrong level 
or to an undefined audience member. It becomes shorthand for you as an in-house trainer to be able to make sure that the person is speaking to the direct target. And I would argue that if the executive reaches Susan, then he or she is probably reaching all of the other people in the audience uh, who matter most. So speak to your target person, identify, and, and really get specific with who that person is. So that concludes part two. And we'll now move on to part three of this webinar, which is uh, several tips, five different tips for answering challenging questions. The first tip that I will offer you, I'm not going to put on the screen yet. Uh, and one thing I should preface this with is to say, there's an organic technique we use called the ATMs that I describe in the Media Training Bible. And instead of going into great depth on that, uh, we don't have time to go into a deep dive on that. I, what I did was I selected five of the, uh, the ideas, five of the techniques that generate a, a really immediate result from the spokespeople that we work with. And the first thing that's just very interesting, and this is the first of the five tips, is when we do these media training sessions, oftentimes we'll have a group of executives or spokespeople around the table, and I'll ask a very challenging question during the interview that the person does not do very well answering, and then we just turn the camera off and we start to talk. And they struggle with how they should answer that question. And they will, they will put themselves into knots trying to come up with the perfect message for that answer. And it's fascinating to watch because oftentimes I know where I'm about to go and they don't know where I'm, I'm about to go. And after I let them talk for 10 or 15 minutes, I will say, let, let me break in here for a moment and ask you a question. I have a confidentiality agreement with you. So anything that you tell me truly is off the record. Um, what's the real answer just for my own background? I would say about two-thirds of the time what they tell me the real answer is, is the perfect media answer. And that's why the first of these five tips I will give you is ask yourself, what's the real answer? Start there. That should always be your starting point. Instead of trying to get so clever with messages, always just begin there. This is so simple. And yet I think it is a natural instinct for people when tough questions start maybe because they have what uh, some people call the curse of knowledge, they know so much background, that they forget to go back there first. So this is your touchstone. And I, as I say, about two-thirds of the time find uh, that that becomes the perfect media response. Obviously, there are times that doesn't happen. Uh, always tell the truth, of course, but it's a question of how you frame the truth uh, the rest of the time when you can't be as direct in your response. Technique number two, give the human answer. Uh, so oftentimes people are so focused on giving the right or corporate answer that they leave their humanity behind. And the, the real pity about that is that when I meet with these executives behind the scenes, they're almost universally caring, feeling people. But something happens when the camera comes on and they try to get themselves into their professional role where they leave that humanity behind. Uh, so I, I want to give you an example, and this is uh, – an example that's very close to some of the examples that we've worked with with clients. Let's say that you work for a small nonprofit organization and your nonprofit's mission is to help women who have been the victims of domestic abuse in your community. As much as you would like to help everybody affected by domestic abuse, your organization has a very specific mandate and runs on a very tight budget and can only offer support services to women and girls who live within the city limits. So when an abused 14-year-old boy who lives just blocks outside of your city's borders approaches your group for help, you have to turn that boy away. Naturally, you would offer him a referral for other groups that may be able to help. You may intervene in some other ways as well. But then the boy goes to the media. Somehow a reporter gets wind of this story. And the boy shares his grueling story to the reporter and claims that you refuse to help him. And guess what? Your organization is cast in a very unflattering light in the media. Unfortunately, the, uh, I guess you'd say, unhuman or non-human answer that I hear people give way too often is something like this. Since the Sunshine Society is a women's only facility, we're unfortunately unable to help boys. We offer to help him by connecting him with another group that works with boys. Factually accurate. It describes exactly what you did, but I would say it's pretty cold. And 
it lacks the humanity that most of us would expect from an organization, particularly one dealing with an abused child or some other person who is viewed to be a victim or an underdog. Uh, a societal underdog. So when I work with clients facing these types of situations, I always remind them to bring their full, full humanity to the forefront and answer a question more along the lines of this. It breaks my heart that we are not equipped to bring this young man into our facility, and it's moments like these that I wish that we had a separate building in which we, in which we could house boys who need our services. But I have personally pledged to do everything I can to help him, and I will accompany him to an appointment with a boys' facility that has the capacity to give him the help he deserves. The thing is, most people feel that. They just forget to say it in the context of an interview. So remind your executives to give that human answer. And remember that the public tends to understand sensible policies. They understand why you're restricted by organizational missions. They don't forgive organizations that respond coolly to people in need. So one thing you can do is after you have filled out that message worksheet that you saw a few slides ago, go back to it, particularly if you're dealing in some way with a crisis or something that could negatively reflect on your reputation, and ask yourself, do these messages sound like they've been written by a real person with real feeling? Or do they sound like 14 people have weighed in and wordsmithed this document to its death in which case, it's probably time to go back and reinsert some of the humanity you genuinely and authentically feel. The third technique for answering challenging questions is to remember to sell the positives. Now, I want to preface this point because I know there are times you have to acknowledge bad news, and there are times you should acknowledge bad news. And this point is not intended to suggest otherwise. But I want to make a slightly separate point here. Executives are often keenly aware of the internal and external criticisms of their company or organization, and oftentimes they encounter such objections during media interviews and public speeches and when they're at cocktail parties. They hear the downsides and criticisms of their companies or organizations often. And as a result, I've found that many executives get so used to defending their work that they forget to continue selling it. One recent client that we worked with, and I've shielded the identity a little bit because I don't want to bust our confidentiality agreement, but a recent client serves as a pretty good example of this. Um, her organization works in the international relief field, and many critics have pointed out how slow her group is in responding to natural disasters. When I asked her about that during the media training session and during the practice interview we did, she answered along these lines. We do the best we can, but there are several factors that are outside of our control and slow us down. We can't get into a devastated area until it's safe to do so, and we need the support of the local government before we can enter an area. Uh, one of my favorite books is called Made to Stick. It's by uh, Chip and Dan Heath. They identify uh, a term called TBU, true but useless. And that kind of message point, I would call a TBU. Everything that person said is true, but in terms of organizational messaging, I would say it's useless. So when we reviewed her answer off camera, I reminded her that based on the reading and research I'd done about her organization, it looked like her group had really made these very impressive strides into shrinking their response time. When she came back on camera, her answer was much more along these lines. Why does it take you so long to get into these devastated areas? Ten years ago, it might have taken us a week to get a full team on the ground. Today, we can do that in three days. We'd all like that to be even faster, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that we've made dramatic improvements which have helped to save countless lives. That answer acknowledges imperfection, but it does it in a positive way and reminds the audience just how much progress that's already been made. So just remember, when you're on the defensive, or somebody's trying to put you on the defensive, don't gloss over the negative. Maybe you acknowledge it, but remember to make the positive case where appropriate as well. Too often, I find that executives, and especially executives under fire, forget to do that. Point number four, return to your messages. You see this boomerang on the screen. It's useless to develop and go through all of that trouble with developing a message document if you begin to stray off of those messages. And there are two times I find that executives tend to go off message. The first time is when they get comfortable. 
the longer the conversation goes, maybe after 10 or 15 minutes, the person being interviewed, uh, their physiological symptoms of nervousness or fear they might be feeling uh, at the beginning of an interview begin to dissipate. And they just begin to enter a conversational mode. Or often they may think to themselves, oh, okay, Brad's been talking to me for 10, hours, uh, for 10 minutes, and he sounds like a pretty decent guy. He's not out to get me. I can relax now. Guess what? I may be a decent guy, but my obligation, my duty is still to follow the story. And if you say something after you've relaxed, I'm going to include it in the story, whether or not it's favorable to your case or not. So that's the first time I find that executives tend to forget to stay on message. And it leads to something that I call the seven-second stray, which is this idea that if if the executive is on message for 59 minutes and 53 seconds of an hour-long interview – and for seven seconds says something flip or sarcastic or otherwise off their message, almost inevitably that's what the reporter will put into the story. Uh, my background is, a, is as a former reporter with ABC News and CNN, and I can tell you that um, if somebody said something that was off message, we would hear it immediately and almost always put it into the piece for that reason uh, because we knew it was unusual. We knew that – When you, as a, let's say, a PR or communications professional, would go behind the scenes to draft messages, you didn't mean for that sentence or phrase to come out of the executive's mouth. And so when we hear it, we include it in the story. So the first time, as as I've said, is when they get comfortable. That's when they begin to drift off message. The other time that executives tend to go off message is when the questions begin getting tougher. Perhaps here, their physiological symptoms begin to heighten, and with that fight-or-flight impulse, with the adrenaline rush, they start entering the conversational mode, sometimes even wanting to debate what I've said. Guess what? That works great for me as the reporter. It does not work great for the executive. So here's a very specific technique you can use with your executives if you face the situation in the practice room. Sometimes I'll put up a T-chart. A T-chart is when you put one long vertical line down the middle of the, let's say, whiteboard, and then the horizontal line toward the top. And on the left-hand side, you might put a tick mark. Every time that you ask a question, you put a tick mark. And every time the executive answers with an on-message response, you put a tick mark on the right side of the column. So it's kind of question on the left, answer on the right. And your goal is to get them, if you've asked 16 questions, to go 16 of 16. This exercise works because it invokes the competitive instinct that so many executives have. They want to go 16 for 16. So if you ask them, say, 16 questions in the practice interview before you introduce this exercise, and upon playback you realize that they only gave an on-message response for six of the 16, they can then spot the immediate improvement that they made when in the next round they hit all of them or they go 14 or 15 for 16. So it's a concrete technique and device you can use to remind them to come back to their messages. And the final point that I would make is don't take the bait. One of my favorite stories, uh, this is a real story given to me by a, or told to me by a, cl- a former client. He was being interviewed, this is the story he told me, he was being interviewed by John Stossel, who at the time was a, one of the anchors of ABC News' 2020 news magazine show. And This was an experienced media guest, and uh, they sat down to do the interview, and Stossel started asking the questions. And within a couple of minutes, my client said that Stossel stood up and said, you're boring. And with that, he proceeded to go on what my client described as a bit of a tirade. He was screaming, everybody's media trained these days. I was told that you would give me a good answer. This is so boring. My client said that Stossel was so upset, there was a spit coming out of his mouth. His face was turning red. And finally, after this continued for a couple of minutes, he turned back to my client and said, if we're going to do this interview, you're going to tell me who's getting screwed here. My client was shell-shocked by this nationally famous anchor who was kind of losing his temper like this. So he was, he was caught off guard. And uh, my client said, okay, fine, fine, we'll do the interview. Stossel kind of bellows, roll tape, sits down and says, who's getting screwed here? And my client says, I'll tell you who's getting screwed here, the American taxpayer, that's who. What do you think was the lead when 2020 aired a few weeks later? My client said it was something like this at the very beginning of the show. Tonight on 2020, I'll tell you who's getting screwed here, the American taxpayer, that's who. So I don't think Stossel was upset for a second. I think he used a very clever, 
journalistic device to throw his subject off guard and get a more unscripted device. My client took the bait. And oftentimes I see this where, let's say a spokesperson, the first eight times I ask you a certain question, you're really good. But by the ninth time I ask you a slightly different version of the same question, I'm relentless and I won't let the subject go, you kind of lose your temper a little bit, or you see kind of that that momentary flare of anger in the person's eyes. Uh, Guess what? For edited interviews, that's the clip I'm going to use. I'm not going to use the first eight. So when people say, you know, uh, that line of questioning deserves a sarcastic response, certainly when it's not in context, when the public will never see the questions that led up to it, it's never a good idea. Now, in a live interaction with an experienced guest, maybe there's a little bit of room for that because at least the public can see the full interaction. But even there, in subsequent iterations, when that moment is made into a clip, it's going to be just that clip that's shown over and over again and not the full interview. So even there, it's a risky device to do. So number five, don't take the bait. With that, I would like to leave you with a concluding thought And then Michelle will open up the floor to your questions, which I look forward to answering. And the final thought I would leave you with is an experience that I had with a client a few years ago. As I've mentioned a few times, we sign confidentiality contracts with our clients, but this client gave me permission to discuss uh, or to write about this specific moment, uh, and so that's why I'm talking about it. Uh, On your screen, you see the commissioner of the LPGA. His name is Mike Wan. I had the pleasure of working with him a couple of years ago. He is uh, about as good as it gets. And when I was researching the LPGA and and Commissioner Wan uh, specifically, I came across an article that ran on ESPN.com in 2010. And this is how the reporter began the article about Mike Wan, who was then the new commissioner of the LPGA. This This is his quote that I'm about to read. There are a few things about new LPGA Commissioner Michael Wan that struck me as noteworthy upon the first time I interviewed him. He makes the call, literally. There is no office assistant or lackey who phones for Mr. Wan, then puts you on hold while the commish gets around to talking. He punches the buttons all by himself, which is momentous for its opposition to others in such positions. It's never Mr. Wan. In fact, it's not even Michael. He instead introduces himself simply as Mike. Again, that might not sound like much, but it's a personal touch others reserve only for the most informal moments. He says, thank you. Not at the end of conversations, which is pretty standard. No, he actually sends an email thanking the interviewer later that day. I can count on one hand the number of times that's happened over the years. That's the end of that quote. My suggestion to each of you, if your executives are not using those reporter friendly tactics. They are so easy. They're so simple to implement immediately. And as you can tell from a reporter for ESPN.com who found that so remarkable that he led off a story by writing about it, it really has an outsized impact on the journalists that you work with. So if you're not doing that as your standard practice, I'd recommend that you think about doing that. If the types of things that I've talked about during this webinar are of interest to you, Two or three times a month, we send out our email newsletter. If you visit our website at mrmediatraining.com, you'll see this block on the upper right-hand side. Uh, All you have to do is enter your email address, and you'll instantly be on the list. We also have an auto-reply series of seven emails you'll receive over three months that have the most important media and public speaking tips that we've really ever written about on the blog that you'll receive every few weeks. So if that's of interest to you, I'd encourage you to go there and join our community. Uh, With that, thank you very much for investing 45 minutes of your time with me so far. I hope some of these tips are useful and, and ideally things that you can implement in your own companies and organizations immediately. Uh, And with that, I'd like Michelle to uh, help solicit your questions, and I look forward to answering them. Thank you, Brad, for a great presentation. That was really insightful. Um, Before we pop into the questions, 
We're going to launch into a quick survey right on your screen. Your feedback is valuable to us as it helps us determine the topics for future webinars and how we can improve them. So we would love for you to fill this out while you're still listening. So while you're filling that out, we will pop into some of the questions and answers session. So we'll start with a question from Juliet. Her question is, what are your thoughts on PR professionals sitting in on the phone or the room during a media interview? And subsequently, how can this role be most helpful and offer the most value? That is a terrific question. And it's one we actually just wrote about on the Mr. Media training blog within the past month. And the only reason I say that is not to promote the blog, but because I raised that as an open question to readers who weighed in with their opinions. So if you're interested in the debate, it's on the website. It, there's not a, I think the results of that question that I asked people did not have a clear-cut answer. I think the answer is it depends. If the purpose of the PR professional sitting in on the interview is in any way to obstruct the interview, obviously the reporter is going to see that as problematic. But I'm of the mindset that I think it is often a good idea for the PR practitioner to sit in for several reasons. First of all, the reporter may ask something that requires follow-up, and it's important for the PR person to know what's needed. That's the role of PR professionals, to be a useful and helpful resource to reporters so they're sitting in is not meant to obstruct, but to help make the reporter's life easier. Uh, I'd also say that from a training standpoint, it's important for the person to sit in to know, okay, maybe that spokesperson is a little rough around the edges and needs some media training before we put him or her in front of reporters again. Maybe by sitting in the PR professional heard the spokesperson say something that was factually inaccurate, and they can correct it. Again, the purpose of that is not obstructing the interview but helping it. Uh, so I generally err on the side of I think it's okay. I do make it a practice to disclose the fact that somebody's sitting in. Uh, and I think the final tip I would give is just think about the type of interview it is and the relationship you have with the reporter, whether or not it's appropriate. Uh, obviously, if it's a, lo if it's a 60 minutes in interrogative piece and somebody's jumping in, the fact that a spokesperson jumped in in the middle of, a live, or in the middle of an interview will be used on the air. Uh, so always be mindful of the moment, uh, but generally I think it's a, a reasonable practice to engage in. Awesome. Thanks. The next question comes from Brett. He asks, what is the single most important piece of advice you can give an executive immediately before an interview? So that question, uh, oh, I think let me, let me back into the answer to that question. The, the thing I wouldn't do immediately before an interview is load the person's mind with new facts and data and remember this and remember this and remember this immediately before, say, they go on set. My feeling there is if you did the work adequately in the training room, Hopefully that executive has developed the muscle memory necessary to remember those important points. And if you have to tell that person eight seconds before they're on the air what that most important point is, uh, I think it's uh, it, probably the game's already been lost uh, at the preparation stage, and, and there's no helping it at that point. If there's one thing, and this, the reason I paused when I got the question is the answer really depends on who the executive is and what I view as their, uh, their, their areas for greatest improvement. But the one thing that immediately comes to mind is they have to like you. They have to believe you. They have to view you as credible. And so if you are charismatic and charming and warm and engaging in your personal life, bring those traits to the interview with you. Let them see who you are. Uh, don't go and don't lapse into this so-called professional mode during the interview where you've left those traits that work for you so effectively in your uh, in your personal and professional life behind. So that would be the one thing I would remind them. Be you and bring the traits that people like so much about you to the interview. That's great. Great advice. Um, and this one is sort of akin to that. Uh, this one comes from Beth. She has a few clients who are concerned about their executives taking on an interview role. So they usually have the PR manager do it. Uh, what are your thoughts on this, and is it okay, or does it devalue the interview for the reporter? I think it depends on the type of story. I, I, you, for, 
for kind of everyday stories that are not in crisis mode, having a PR manager can be appropriate. And in fact, there are times when it's preferable for a PR manager to do the interview because if you suddenly have an executive weighing in on the answers, it could make the story, whatever the story is, look bigger than it really is. But I would be very concerned about not having a, an executive team prepared uh, for interviews. Um, I, I would advocate media training, obviously, for those people. I know there's self-interest in the recommendation, but there's a lot of media trainers out there. It certainly doesn't have to be me. But I would always want an executive to be well-prepared to be able to step in, particularly if a situation, even if it's not a crisis, if a serious situation uh, emerges. And one other tip I might give. So if your executives are not kind of naturally um, gifted at media interviews, one thing is, that I always think to do is start them in the minor leagues. Get them some media training. Uh, and then start them in the minors. When you get that request from a blog that is a very small readership or from a podcast that you can tell probably has 13 listeners, get them on the phone. Let them practice with, with those smaller outlets first to start building that muscle memory uh, I spoke about a minute ago so that it's there when they actually need it. So I would get them in the game as quickly as possible, but you don't have to start with the highest profile local daily newspaper or television affiliate. Awesome. Thanks. Um, and this one comes from Brooke. Uh, what are your best tips on killing the interview if your executive is tanking? <laughs> <laughs> so I would assume from the question, would you read that to me one more time? Yes. What are the best tips for killing the interview if your exec is tanking? <laughs> there you have a very difficult decision to make. It's kind of like you're choosing between bad and really bad. Um, and you have to decide which one is bad and which one is really bad. Uh, it, it's either the first thing it is is I'm going to jump in in the middle of an interview, cut it off, which if it's a print interview will be written into the story, probably with some poisonous words by the reporter, or will be shown in a continuous loop on, the, on television. But if I let the executive continue to talk, it's going to cause even more damage. So you have to decide in that moment which of those two things is worse. Um, I, I, there's an example that I think about that we posted to the blog a few years ago. Um, Colin Powell, who was then Secretary of State, he was on Meet the Press with the late Tim Russert. Uh, Tim Russert was interviewing uh, Secretary Powell, and about six minutes into the interview, the camera veers off to the side. And you hear from Powell's end of the interview, it was a remote interview, from Powell's end of the interview, you hear somebody said, Russert's gone over his time. And Russert says, Mr. Secretary, it sounds like somebody's cutting off the interview and is asking you not to answer my questions. I don't think that's appropriate. And Colin Powell said, uh, to his credit, he said, Emily, that was the name of his staffer, get out of the way, move the camera back, move the camera back. Okay, Tim, I'm ready for you again. Let's answer that. Ask me that question again. And so Powell handled it really well in that moment, but you could see how reporters will, even in the moment as it's occurring live, will punish the person who tries to get in their way and obstruct. Uh, so I guess in the moment the best advice I could give you is just make sure that it's worth the bad press that will result from you jumping in and that the thing you're trying to stop is worse than that would be. Thank you. Um... This next question comes into us, sorry, I lost it, um, from, from Margie. And her question is, it's a two-part. So what is your opinion of making off-the-record comments or answers to questions? And then the second part is also about providing printed backup with statistics to give reporters uh, in, in an interview so that they're not under pressure to get all the statistics correct. Terrific. So question number one about off the record, some media trainers, I think probably the norm in the industry is to recommend that you never go off the message, uh, off the record. Personally, I find that to be a little bit too simplistic. There are times when going off the record might make sense. Certainly in the political world, you see it. Uh, there are times when, there are times, for example, if a reporter is about to write a piece that is factually wrong, and you don't want your fingerprints over it for some reason. Maybe it's a sensitive piece of legislation and you don't want to be on the record because if you were, it could thwart uh, politician support for your piece of legislation or the, the legislation you're advocating. That might be a moment where telling the reporter off the record uh, that the information they're about to print is incorrect. 
So I do think there's a role for it. What I always recommend to our trainees is this. First of all, and, and unfortunately I have a feeling many people on the call have probably experienced this the hard way, off the record is not a guarantee. So what I recommend is, first of all, reporters you have a longer relationship with are more reliable about keeping the trust, but even they can be overruled by an editor, and there's no sacrosanct uh, attorney-client privilege when it comes to off the record between reporters and their sources. So first, make sure you know who the reporter is, and hopefully you've had a relationship with them, and they've been good about uh, keeping that trust in smaller ways in the past. And the other thing that I would say is make sure you define the term. Different reporters have different definitions of what these terms mean. One of the really interesting things I've found, and I'm going to generalize here because this is certainly not true across the board, but generally speaking, I find that old, older school reporters view off the record as I can't tell anybody this information, even my, my mother or my spouse. Newer reporters often say I can use the information, but I'm, I can't quote you by name. So they view off the record almost as a not for attribution situation. But that's problematic, too, because oftentimes with not for attribution, you're able to figure out who the person is that said it. So what I would say to you is make sure that it, it is an experienced PR person who's vetting the reporter, uh, who knows the risks associated with going off the record, who's willing to pay the price by that off the record agreement being breached, because perhaps the risk is worth taking. Uh, but it should never be done spontaneously in the moment. It should be a deliberate, strategic, hopefully uh, uh, preordained strategy. Uh, and not something done spontaneously. The second question about printed backup, I'm really glad that Brooke brought that up because, yes, one of the things that I say is your job during an interview is not to be a Wikipedia page. You're of very little value as a spokesperson if all that you're doing is giving the reporter who, what, when, where, why. Your job is to give all of those facts meaning and place them in the context. You want those facts to live during the interview, and then you can follow up or even proceed the interview by giving that one or two page fact sheet that has all of that key information. Great, um, and we're running short on time, so I've sort of combined these two questions together. They're similar in nature. Um, but it's about advice for dealing with multiple reporters at once who might jump from topic to topic, as well as being ambushed by a reporter. So how, what, what, what would be your advice for, for those situations? I assume by multiple reporters at once, the setting would probably be a press conference or a scrum uh, of Correct. some sort. Uh, and there, I think, the best advice I can give is in the – actually, let me give you a specific exercise we use to prepare people for that, and it's a fun one to use in the training room. Let's say you're about to send an executive off to that type of situation where you may be surrounded by 20 different reporters asking questions that are all over the map. What I love to do is get as many other people in the room as you possibly can in the training room. All of those people, let's say the fellow executives, maybe some senior managers, all become the, the rapacious press corps, firing the most damaging, difficult, off-topic, left-field uh, left questions they can imagine at that executive to prep them for the real-life setting. Uh, you've probably heard that referred to before as a murder board, uh, and almost always what I've found is the murder boards in the uh, practice room is much more difficult than it is uh, when you actually get in front of reporters. This is the reason that swimmers, often Olympic swimmers, for example, will practice with three swimsuits on so that there's more drag and more resistance when they're practicing so that when they actually get in the pool, they can glide a little bit more gracefully. So that's what I'd recommend for that. Ambush interviews, the, the one piece of advice that I can give you, if you're ever ambushed, deny the reporter the visual. What reporters are going for in an ambush setting is a compelling visual that makes you look bad that they can play over and over again on their newscasts. Deny them the visual. Give a pleasant smile. I'd be happy to schedule some time with you so we could talk about this further. You're slowly backing up to your destination, the front door of a building, to your car. Again, I'd be happy to speak to you. I have a meeting to get to uh, right now. But call my office. Here's my card, and we'd be happy to set something up with you. That type of approach denies the visual, shows the public that you're not trying to avoid. You can even make a more assertive statement, such as, we've worked together before. You're ambushing me here at my office because you want a great visual, but why don't we do this the right way? Let's sit down together. That's an assertive technique that only some people can pull off well, but it's another option for you uh, during an ambush setting. But deny the visual. 
Excellent. And we are pretty much at the top of the hour. So I want to thank everybody for submitting your questions. Uh, I want to let you again know that we will have a copy of this presentation available for you um, out on Cision.com and on SlideShare after the webinar. Um, you can find other archived webinars on our website as well and some excellent research slides um, from past webinars. And of course, you can find us on Facebook and Twitter. Um, we are Cision, Cision, a leading global media intelligence company serving the complete workflow of today's communications social media, and content marketing professionals. And Cision also represents the Gorkana Group, PR Web, Help a Reporter Out, Haro, and Eye Contact Brands. And Brad, we want to thank you once again for a wonderful presentation, and thanks for joining us today. Have a great day, thank everyone. Thank you very much.